So next up to our podium is Seattle Four member and past president, Carl Eggie to introduce today's main speaker. Carl, over to you. Thank you, President Jeff. I'm delighted to introduce to the Rotary Club of Seattle, the former attorney general of the state of Washington, Rob McKenna. Rob graduated from the University of Washington Phi Beta Kappa in 1985 with degrees in both economics and international studies and was a student body president. In 1988, he graduated from the University of Chicago Law School where he was a member of Law Review. Returning home, Rob was an attorney in the Bellevue office of Perkins Coie for eight years practicing corporate and regulatory law for a wide range of the firm's clients. 1995, Rob left the firm and uh, ran for King County Council. He was elected uh, to the council and he served there for eight years, focusing his efforts on regulatory reform and economic development. And in 2004, he mounted a successful campaign as the Republican candidate for state attorney general. Debating Rebecca Sen before Seattle Rotary that fall and winning the election by a wide margin. Rob served as our Attorney General for two terms, during which he focused on a wide variety of issues important to the state, including something important to Rotary, curbing human trafficking. He was highly regarded nationally and was elected President of the Association of State Attorney Generals. In 2012, Rob ran for Governor, losing narrowly to Jay Inslee. For the last nine years, Rob has been a partner in the Seattle office of San Francisco-based Ora Carrington and Sutcliffe, focusing his efforts on regulatory and technology issues. He chairs the state attorney general team within the firm's public policy group, where he is a highly ranked nationally on matters involving regulatory reform, cybersecurity, and privacy. One of the few Republicans in recent years to win a statewide election in Washington, Rob will share with us today his thoughts on a topic of critical importance to our democracy, our two-party political system, and why he remains a member today of the Republican Party. Please join me in welcoming one of our state's most outstanding citizens and public servants, as well as a damn good lawyer, Rob McKenna. Carl, thank you. Thank you so very much. I really appreciate this opportunity to be back to speak to Seattle for Rotary. I, uh, I want to give a shout out to Michael. Loved your presentation, Michael. And uh, it reminded me that my daughter, Madeline, the oldest of my four kids, worked with TIPS when she was in high school at Newport High School and uh, got a tremendous, tremendous experience out of it. So glad to hear that TIPS is still going well and going strong. Uh, it, it's just... Uh, it's just a pleasure to be back speaking to all of you in part because I was a member of Bellevue Rotary for over 20 years. My wife, Amy, has been a member of the club for over 10 years and is co-leading its DEI task force today. And they, I know they've looked at the good work that Seattle 4 has done in that area for inspiration and ideas. So congratulations to all that, uh, that Seattle 4 continues to accomplish for the community and for Rotary generally. The last time I spoke to Seattle Four was not the, that debate with Deborah Sen. It was when uh, I came in to talk about my work as Attorney General. Um, I had my uh, youngest child, Connor, with me. He was eight years old, and he was uh, seated at a table up in the front over at the Seattle Convention Center. And uh, I remember having to interrupt my speech to address him directly and ask him to stop playing with the ice cubes in his glass of water with his fork. Um, and everyone was very, <laughs> that actually probably was the highlight of my speech, to be honest. But uh, I'll just, I mentioned that in part because Connor just finished his junior year of college. And it just reminds me of how fast time goes by. As I did back in that speech in 2008, I, I'm going to be talking about politics and about governing. But unlike when I spoke to you as attorney general, this talk is going to be more personal. I'm, I'm not here, obviously, as a statewide elected official, but as a private citizen. And as a citizen who remains politically engaged and concerned, I'm wrestling with some fundamental questions that uh, result from the tumultuous years we've all just experienced. These, question, these questions include at least three important queries. Number one, why am I still a Republican when I find myself among the about 15% of self-identified Republicans who do not support Donald Trump? Number two, what is the future of our country's 
two-party system. And number three, assuming we continue to have two major political parties, what do I do next if I want to remain Republican but change my party and its direction? Let me start by providing a little bit of my political biography. I think it helps put in context uh, what I'm going to tell you the answers are to those questions that I just posed, what my, what my conclusions are as I think about those very personal questions. I was not born into a political family. My dad grew up in the Depression. He joined uh, the Army in 1942, served in the South Pacific on the crew of a B-24 Liberator, uh, went on to make a career out of the military, fighting above the 38th parallel in, uh, North, in Korea, what is now North Korea. And then um, he was the chief narcotics investigator for the US Army in Saigon uh, in 1970-71. So he spent over 34 years uh, in the military and, uh, and he gave me an amazing example of public service, but not a political involvement. My mom was a committed uh, volunteer who had also been a school teacher for many years uh, and donated countless hours to serving uh, causes through the Catholic Church. Uh, so, you know, I wasn't around politics a lot. And I think my first partisan political event came after my dad retired from the military when I tagged along with my mom to a Republican precinct caucus meeting in Bellevue. I can't remember how my dad got out of going, but my mom uh, took me along and she was there to support Jerry Ford, uh, even, even though a majority of those present were supporting Ronald Reagan. At the University of Washington, I was uh, an independent. It wasn't until I started volunteering for particular individual candidates that I gravitated towards the GOP and made my uh, decision to become a Republican. I supported people like Tim Hill for King County Executive, Rod Chandler for Congress, worked with Jennifer Dunn when she became Washington State Republican Chair. By the time I came back from law school <clears throat> in Chicago and dove into civic and political life on the East Side, I joined a GOP that was defined by the Reagan-Bush years. That's the GOP that I really grew up in, politically speaking. Conservatives, moderates working together. It's the party whose ranks I climbed. In 2000, I supported Texas Governor George W. Bush for president. His reelection campaign in our state in 2004 helped me win my first race for AG by almost 10%, even though Governor Bush or then President Bush lost the state himself by about 7%. Point is, he came in, he campaigned, he didn't take the state for granted. It was helpful to candidates like me. In 2008, I was running for re-election as attorney general, but I also chaired Senator John McCain's Washington state campaign for president, having helped organize Republican state AGs to be the first group of statewide elected officials to endorse uh, Senator McCain for president. As a military kid myself and a reader of his biography, I greatly admired Senator McCain and got to know him a bit. And I helped other organize, as I said, helped to organize those other Republican AGs to support him as well. Now I won statewide reelection in 2008 by nearly 19%. I had uh, over 59% of the statewide vote. I carried King County that year with almost 54% of the vote, even though Senator McCain received only 28% of the King County vote and about 40.5% statewide. So when we talk about how polarized politics has become nationally and in our state, just think about how many Washington voters had to split their ticket in 2008 to make those numbers possible. In 2012, as Carl mentioned, I ran for governor as the highest ranking Republican in the state. And I had strong support from a number of Republican governors at the time who came into the state to campaign for me. People like Governor Bobby Jindal of Louisiana, Susanna Martinez of New Mexico, Scott Walker from Wisconsin, Chris Christie from uh, New Jersey, as well as former Governor Jeb Bush, who I became good friends with over our shared interest in education reform. I lost that election by 3%, carrying the majority of 47 out of 49 legislative districts which means that Governor Inslee's entire margin was produced by two legislative districts in Seattle where he and other Democrats won 85% of the vote in an election defined by heavy turnout over two ballot measures, marriage and marijuana. So let's fast forward now to the 2016 presidential election. Several of the Republican governors who had helped me in 2012 ran for president in a field so crowded with talent 
some commentators referred to the GOP's embarrassment of riches. Ultimately, however, it just became an embarrassment for many of them. I co-chaired Governor John Kasich's Washington State campaign that year with Slade Gorton, but obviously that was too little too late. Governor Kasich didn't even have the resources to campaign in Washington. Watching the results come in on election night that uh, year in 2016, November, from a local TV studio where I was helping do uh, commentary, I was reminded of a debate I had seen at a business conference in 2014 that I had attended and spoke at. James Carville debated a Republican political consultant I'd never heard of before and frankly haven't heard of since. What I remember from that lunchtime debate was Carville. Essentially, Carville made an extended argument as to why Republicans would never win the presidency again. He said that the party was too dependent on white voters who represented a shrinking share of the total national vote. He predicted it would go down to 70 or 72 percent of the vote by 2016. Well, as it turns out, if enough people in a group accounting for 70 or 72 percent of the national vote decide to vote a certain way, it is still possible to win the White House, especially when you have an electoral college. And that's exactly, of course, what happened, much to everyone's surprise, including, I think, all of us in that TV studio uh, on election night, November 2016. A few days after that election, I was in DC and attended a private briefing featuring a consultant from the Trump campaign. He explained that by September of that year, people already, almost everyone who was a likely voter already knew how they planned to vote. So the Trump campaign focused on the undecided voters. Now, he didn't mean voters who had not decided for whom to vote. He meant voters who hadn't decided whether to vote. They focused their efforts on turning those folks out to vote, not unlike the way the Obama campaign effectively turned out low propensity voters in her, his first campaign. And it, it turned out to be uh, very, very successful. Fast forward to the 2020 presidential election. Now in late 2019, early 2020, I was giving speeches about the future of politics and about the presidential election. Uh, and I made the following point to explain why I thought that time, President Trump would probably be reelected, even though his approval ratings uh, were usually in the low 40s. I thought it was likely he would win for the same reason that every president since 1900 who presided over a strong economy was reelected, whereas every incumbent president running for reelection with a bad economy lost, unless you count Calvin Coolidge in 1924, who was running for a term in his own right after succeeding Warren G. Harding, who died in office in 23. Or you could say FDR was reelected in a bad economy in, say, 1936, because the economy was still pretty weak. But most voters credited the efforts he was making and blamed his predecessor for the Great Depression. So it shouldn't be surprising that President Trump w didn't win re-election when you consider that no incumbent who's run for re-election with a bad economy has been re-elected since 1900, much less someone running for re-election with a bad economy and a worldwide pandemic. It shouldn't be a shock that Trump lost. You also have to, as I know you are right now, thinking about the fact that in, when he won in 2016, it was by a very narrow, by very narrow margins in a few battleground states like Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin, that allowed him to carry the electoral college, become president while not winning the uh, popular vote. Democrats successfully mobilized voter turnout in those states and did a much better job than they had done in 2016. In 2020, they were able to carry those three states and then they carried other states that they flipped like Arizona and Georgia, again, partly due to very effective voter turnout efforts. In fact, voter turnout is the key to understanding the 2020 election combined with the macroeconomic uh, and other factors I've already mentioned. Voter turnout was not just high in 2020 for, president, for the presidential election, it was historically high. It produced over 74 million votes for Trump, making him the candidate who'd received more votes for president than any candidate in US history, except for one, Joe Biden. Because while Trump received over 74 million, Biden received over 81 million. 
In other words, 51.3% to 46.8%. More than 159 million Americans voted in 2020. That is by far the largest total vote in American history. And it was the first time that more than 140 million people voted. It's a lot more than 140 million people. Voter turnout was the highest in 2020 in the presidential election in 120 years and it, it, as measured as a percentage of voting eligible population, nearly 67%. Now, as we've all seen and heard, none of those facts stopped President Trump and now former President Trump from insisting that the election had been stolen from him. We went from the biggest voter turnout ever to the big lie. So where are Republicans now and where do I find myself in this landscape? I'm gonna share some slides with you now that I think help illustrate uh, the problems that the Republican party uh, is facing. And I'm gonna bring the screen over so I can see it myself. Assuming I could get it to work. There we go. Oh, sorry, I went a little too fast. Let me back up. This is a little bit of a pause. There we go. I want to start with this slide. It's uh, It was produced by Echelon Insights, a survey research company titled Segmenting the American Right. And it, you could go blind staring at this thing uh, or spend 15 or 20 minutes studying it. So let, don't don't bother. I will just... Uh, tell you what's obvious from the slide, which is that, that conservative voters, the American right, are badly fractured. Uh, Republicans only represent 30% of them, or, or I should say 30% uh, of, uh, of the 100%, including 57% of voters who are not conservative. But you can see you have conservatives who do not consider themselves Republicans. You have uh, people who are not conservative who, who support Trump. Uh, it's uh, it's a challenging situation. I mean, what it shows is that number one, people who self self identify as, as Republicans, like I do, are in a, a minority as conservatives. We represent 39% of registered voters because, uh, and that uh, that total includes conservatives who aren't regular Republicans or Trump supporters. That's the purple area, and Trump supporters who aren't conservative or Republican. That's the brown area. So. Conservatives are fractured right now. Only 15% out of the 39% uh, of voters who identify as Republicans, uh, you know, 15% don't support Trump. Again, the red area, and another 13% are conservative Republicans who do support Trump, and then 2% are Republicans who support Trump but aren't conservatives. Are you dizzy yet? It's complicated, uh, and it makes it very hard to figure out what to do when, like me, you find yourself in the 15%. Let me go to the next slide, which I think makes is a little bit easier to follow. Fabrizio Lee conducted research, and they concluded there are five tribes within the Republican Party. So you'll see you see the Never Trump tribe again, again, fifteen percent. The post Trump GOP at twenty percent. These are people who like Trump but want to move on, move on from Trump. You have the Trump boosters at twenty eight percent who are you know, fans of Trump, but they're more supportive of the GOP as a party than of Trump personally. Then you have the diehard Trumpers at 27% who are the opposite. They're more supportive of Trump than of the Republican party. And then you have the group that is the scariest to me, the InfoWars GOP as this company calls them. They are nearly unanimous in support of Trump. They are the strongest group when it comes to supporting Trump. They believe in QAnon conspiracy theories much of the time. Uh, and uh, many of them have come into the Republican Party because of Donald Trump. Now, let me talk about this slide and, and what all of that data means uh, and why it's such a big challenge for the Republican Party and its future. First thing to remember is that Trump was not a Republican until a few years before deciding to run for president in 2016. That's kind of ironic. Of course, neither was Bernie Sanders a Democrat. I'm pro in fact, he's officially still not a Democrat, but you know, Trump has come in and, be very, and been very effective at doing two things, winning base Republican support and bringing more people in to vote for him uh, and sometimes to vote for the Republican ticket. 
So but now what you have, as this, as this chart shows, looking at the two bar charts on the left side of it, uh, is that among all Republicans, nearly half are more supportive of Trump than of the GOP, and a little over half are more supportive of the GOP than of Trump. Now, since only 30% of voters self-identify as Republicans to begin with, this is not a winning combination for taking back the White House. Notwithstanding that challenge, Republicans after the 2020 election still were control more state legislatures, 30 Republican controlled, 18 Democratic controlled, two split, control more governor's offices, 27, and more AG offices, 26, while maintaining 50 US Senate seats and being within striking distance in the House. Party isn't over, in other words. The question is, what kind of Republican Party will it be? The Reagan-Bush era, I'm sad to say, is clearly over, for now anyway, and probably forever, because these eras are defined by personalities, and those personalities have passed from the scene, and things don't last forever when the leaders who created the movements disappear or pass away. If you look at this chart, what you see is 51% of Republicans would support a Trump candidate, 37% would support a Reagan Republican, and 12% would support a Bush candidate. So they're pretty evenly split over what kind of Republican president they wanna see in the future. The next presidential election is going to be a real test of whether or not the party is able to move beyond Trump or not. So let me just stop sharing. A minute, one second. Oh, one sec, sorry. Too many, too many things going on at one time. There we go. Yeah, shoot, I need to bring back the full screen to stop sharing. Oh, no, I'm on the wrong screen, that's why. There we go. So for me and for a lot of self-identified Republicans, the question is, where do we go from here? Simply put, there are you know three main options, I guess. One is to leave the Republican Party. Then the question is, where do you go? So that leads to the second question, do you become an independent voter? And the third option, of course, is to become a Democratic voter, assuming that the only choices we you know, choose to consider are the, you know, the major parties or the major options. I will say that as for the first option, leaving the Republican Party, I, th I think I'm just too stubborn. I mean, after all, I self-identify as an American who is Catholic, an Eagle Scout, a Republican, and a Mariners fan, pretty much in that order, actually. Leaving means giving up on a party in which I've invested a lot. And it means leaving it to some people who I don't like very much. And a lot of other people who I do, who I do like very much who deserve good leadership. And again, if I were to leave the GOP, raises the obvious question, where would I go? Now, for example, it's hard to know what being a, quote, independent really means. I think it just means sitting on the sidelines for the most part, throwing rocks at both sides. But I understand why a lot of people choose to do that. Uh, but I wanna be active, I wanna be, I wanna be engaged, and that means need to pick a team and put on their uniform. So one option I would have is to leave the Republican party and put on the Democrat blue uniform. But you know, as someone who's been an admirer of a number of Democratic leaders over the years, I look at a Democratic party that is obviously not the party of JFK, who my father loved, or of Scoop Jackson, who I greatly admired. I went to the Jackson School of International Studies at the UW. Uh, and it's a party that's increasingly removed even from Democratic centr centrists like Bill Clinton. And of course, as major political parties commonly do, the Democratic party has its own problems and fractures. They're temporarily less conspicuous because as usual, when you're the party out of power, you're able to unite around the idea of getting back into power. Uh, and those, those episodes of unity uh, will tend to conceal underlying fissures. Now, as my wife Amy has pointed out to me, and I should note that she has excellent instincts as an executive coach and strategic planner, she doesn't need mounds of data on a slide deck to figure this out like I do. She pointed out to me that there really seem to be four major political parties in America today, loosely speaking. There are Biden Democrats, Sanders or AOC Democrats, Trump Republicans, and what I call 
traditional or Reagan Bush or Chamber of Commerce Republicans. But of course, when it comes down to campaigns and elections, there aren't actually four major political parties. There are still just two. They continue to be two sprawling, sometimes, if not mostly unwieldy, often fractious coalitions of voters, interest groups, and politicians. We will never have, in my opinion, a multi-party system in this country for a fundamental reason of how our constitution is written uh, and, and, and how states have applied these constitutional rules, like the electoral college. Say, Rob, because, forgive me for interrupting, but oh, sorry. we've got just a boodle of questions in the okay. chat. So you're, you you're in us, luck. I'm, I'm literally, I'm literally one minute away from wrapping up. So that's perfect. And thanks, thanks for helping me keep track of time because it's really hard to do. Uh, but I, I'll just wrap up. Thank you. So there aren't actually four major political parties. There, there really are just two. They're going to continue to be only two because we allocate presidential electors on a winner-take-all basis in the states. Uh, and if you don't believe me, consider the fact that if we we're going to have a multi-party system, it would have happened by now. I also don't think that one of the two major political parties, like the Republican Party, is going to disappear and be replaced by another party. The last time that happened in the, 19, in the 1850s, uh, it was because we were leading up to a civil war. I don't think, I don't think that's going to happen. So uh, I would just encourage all of you to consider who your leaders are, get involved, uh, whatever party you prefer, uh, and support good people, because we continue to be a country that depends on people volunteering themselves for election. And uh, it, we get the government we vote for and that we work for. Thank you. And now I'm happy to take questions. Super. Thank and I'll just uh, quickly interject, Ken, that um, yeah. that's the best detailed explanation for really in-depth understanding of what's happening behind the curtain of the trauma in the Republican Party today. So thanks for that. Ken, over to you. Those were exactly the words that I was going to use. Rob, it's always good to see you. Welcome back to the club. And thanks for your, it always, you always strike me as very unbiased, which I think is, uh, which I think is refreshing. All right. So we've got a lot more questions than we have time for. We have about nine minutes. We're going to start off with a big one. Hoping Rob can comment on what happened to Liz Cheney today. Uh, so my German shepherd is barking in the background. She's not commenting on Liz Cheney, but I will probably have to hop up, open the door uh, and let her out. So that's my Connor story for this speech. Uh, Liz Cheney is uh, courageous, and we need more leaders like her to step up and push back against the big lie about a stolen election. Um, that's not the only reason that she lost her leadership post. There are other reasons as well, uh, but I think she's done the country a service, and I am sorry that she lost that post, even though she obtained it by defeating my friend Catherine Morris Rogers in 2018. Uh, but uh, but I, I respect that she's putting courage and principle above party, and we need more of that. Okay, you go let the dog out while I read this really long question. Ready? Can you hear me? Thank you for your work fight, to fight sex trafficking. From your perspective, what is the most significant recent milestone concerning the fight against sex trafficking? Biggest milestone. The biggest milestone was the uh, attorneys general of the country coming together and starting to push to bring attention to the issue and to get a key federal law rewritten to allow us to fight back against outfits like Backpage.com. Um, my initiative as president of the National Association of AGs was to highlight human trafficking. It's now a permanent initiative of NAG, the National Association of AGs. Uh, and we've now seen Congress in the last couple of years make solid moves to combat human trafficking in part by holding online companies accountable. Um, we need more of that. We have a long way to go, but I will tell you, when I started working on human trafficking in 20, 2009, 2010, there was no one talking about it in, uh, in government. And now there are lots and lots of people talking about it uh, all the time. Good. How can the GOP continue to support Matt Getz while simultaneously rejecting Liz Cheney? I, I don't know. Uh, Matt's, Matt Getz is, is despicable. Uh, he needs to leave Congress and leave the party. I, there's no excuse. Uh, and unfortunately, that, that kind of severe misbehavior uh, is not confined to him, as we saw with the Jeffrey Epstein episode and, and all the people who voluntarily associated with him uh, on a on strikingly bipartisan or nonpartisan basis. 
I find myself wanting to interject my own thoughts here, but I'm going to keep on reading the questions. Go, Ken, go. Well, I, I watch all this happen, and I'm a foreigner, and I can't even vote in either country, but it, it seems so confusing to me that you can't raise your hand in a country filled with free speech, make a comment, and all of a sudden be ripped down. It's like being back in Australia where we had tall poppy syndrome. You could never say that, and you were brought down. Anyway, there you go. That's my 25 seconds. Will you consider returning to public service in the Washington state in the future? Not if it means holding elected office, not, not in the foreseeable future. Uh, I was in office for 17 years and I loved it, but I also love being a lawyer and a, and a partner at Oric and all the work I get to do. And so it's a good time to, to, uh, to do that. And, and I guess never say never, but I will tell you where my focus is right now is on identifying, helping recruit, supporting and electing good candidates for nonpartisan office, Republicans for partisan office. And I got my share of Democrats I really like also. Uh, so, uh, you know, you just have to find good people and help them get elected. That's ultimately what drives partisan politics. It's the people who are leading, who are out in front. Yeah, get it. The Republican Party has just made embarrassing a huge lie about the integrity of our elections and litmus test for leadership. And by implication, for future candidacy for the local, state, and national levels. Add to that the vote suppressing legislation being passed in many states. And one must ask, what possible role is left in the Republican Party for rational conservatives? I think there's a question in there, at least there's maybe a comment from yeah. you. Well, you, you, you have to stay in and stay in the fight, uh, I think, if, if you want to be or, or if you think you're a Republican and, and you care about the future of the country, not just of the party. Uh, and so you need to get in and push back against the big lie. Uh, and I think candidates uh, who, who are running as Republicans need to speak to that uh, and not not remain silent, but speak up and say, you know what, we lost. Here's why we lost. Here's what we're going to do differently. Because elections are won and lost. It's a little bit like baseball. You just will not bat a thousand. And frankly, countries in which one political party bat a thousand bats a thousand are not countries we want to live in. Uh, on the issue of of the voter legislation, uh, I think I think some of it is is definitely not supportable. Some of it is overblown in terms of its impact. But I will say this: whether you like it or hate it it's pretty clear why it's happening. It's because of that huge voter turnout in 2020. I think that's more than anything is what uh, is causing Republicans in other states to try to, to raise the bar uh, for voting. Should we eliminate electoral college and could that be done? No and, yet, uh, no, and no. I don't think we should eliminate it because I think there, there were sound reasons to adopt it to begin with. It was a compromise enacted in the Constitutional Convention in order to uh, allow smaller states to protect themselves from the influence of bigger states. Uh, and I think that's, as a republic uh, of 50 states, I think that continues to be yeah. valuable. Secondly, it's not going to happen because to amend the United States Constitution, uh, you have to pass uh, the amendment through Congress with two thirds of the House and two thirds of the Senate. Then you have to persuade three quarters of the state legislatures to adopt it by uh, simple majorities. It's pretty obvious that states that would be disadvantaged, which would be the majority of states, uh, are not going to vote to do that. Okay. Why are Republicans and most Democrats so afraid of universal health care? That's, that's a great question. And I think the simplest answer is that uh, we, still, we still, as a people, as a culture, tend to be pretty, pretty independent. Uh, and uh, that doesn't just include people who've been here for generations. So I gave a speech explaining my lawsuit challenging the Affordable Care Act, certain aspects of it, uh, on the steps of the state capitol, and uh, just about everybody who came up to talk to me afterwards was an immigrant. I was struck by that. They were from Eastern Europe, they were from Africa, they're from other places. They, they were in, invariably people who had fled autocratic regimes, and they were suspicious of government-run health care, like they're suspicious of a lot of government-run programs. Having said that, I always thought, and I think today, that the, the, the most efficient and, uh, and easiest way to expand healthcare to every American is to expand Medicaid. Uh, but I think Americans are going to continue to want to have a private pay option, private insurance. And we saw in the Democratic uh, primaries last year uh, that pushing for eliminating 
private insurance and replacing it with an entire single payer system didn't fly very well, even with a lot of base Democratic voters. So I would say expand Medicaid, continue to make sure is, uh, that people are covered. Uh, I think the controversy over uh, the Affordable Care Act is largely passed uh, and that uh, we're, we're moving in the right direction overall. Okay, good. You got 30 seconds to answer the next question. Considering the changing democratic demo, demographics of the country, is there any future for Republican Party as long as it embraces the Trump style white nationalism? Go. No, there is no future for the Republican Party unless we tack back strongly away from that. And I think people like Nikki Haley can help us do that and Marco Rubio and maybe Bobby Jindal, Susanna Martinez, there, there are people who can help us do that, but that has to happen or the party really will disappear, at least being relevant nationally. That was awesome. You're awesome. Hey, <clears throat> thank you so much, Rob. We really appreciate you being here today. We, uh, we, you got a lot of great comments, a lot of great questions. I don't know if you can hang out and answer any of these questions. There's a lot more questions than I've ever seen before. So, uh, thank you for stirring the pot. Thanks I'll do my best. Thanks a lot, Ken. All right. Let's send this over to our big gold sponsor of the week. Every week is B Bob Alexander. Without his help, we wouldn't be able to share today's conversation with Rob to all of our friends and families through our very own YouTube channel. If you're interested in becoming a sponsor of our great club, please get hold of Carolyn. Have a great week.